On this week's DCS sit ramp, we talk about an update that was injected via a hotfix for the C-130J. Eagle Dynamics talks updates coming to the Marianas World War II version of the map, which corrects runway taxi logic and makes improvements to landing paths. And lastly, a plug for the Virtual International Air Festival going on this weekend. Welcome back to the DCS Sip Rip. I'm your host, Prickly Hedgehog, once again, talking about the world's premier combat flight simulator for the home PC, DCS World. And it got a big boost recently with the arrival of the C-130J Hercules, which is a magnificent heavy lifting medium range aircraft from Airplane Simulation Company. It's been fantastic. I really love this aircraft. So naturally, as I said last week, with the introduction of a new aircraft, oftentimes you get some quick updates, some quick fixes following a big patch. And as I said, the introduction of an aircraft such as this, sure enough, we did have a hot fix. So what did it include? Well, there were several launch issues. These included crashes to the game being caused by ray tracing so those have been addressed. Also the use of the MOAB and mark points, that's been corrected when loading specific instant action missions. New missions from Sedlow have also been added and existing missions from Sedlow, Gambit and Baltic Dragon have been updated, so good news there. You'll also find some new liveries. These come from Air China, Royal New Zealand Air Force, which I was particularly pleased to see, and the Japan Air Self-Defense Force. And this accompanied accuracy improvements to existing paint schemes, which is nice to see. AVX CPU requirements have been removed to broaden hardware compatibility. Also good news. So these are advanced vector extensions effectively, which provide special instructions to improve CPU performance. Now, in addition to those changes, they've also updated the electronic flight bag, which now offers usability pass with clearer loadmaster feedback a restart button, improved logbook behavior, better low volume control, a virtual keyboard for notes and radios and various UI refinements, including the renamed media tab and persistent auto reverse selection, uh, among others, I believe. So really good updates there. And smaller but important polishing includes corrected tooltips and labels, an updated uh, ream menu graphic, a more visible load master icon, fixes for flare and chaff quantity updates, cockpit view behavior and a desync issue that could lead to wing separation. So what an incredible introduction for this aircraft, uh, well beyond my expectations for a aircraft of this type and size. I have really enjoyed getting some seat time, not enough seat time unfortunately this week, so I really want to get more time. Hopefully during the break here coming up, I can get some seat time with this thing because it's thoroughly enjoyable to fly, as I said, much more so than what I expected. Typically, you know, these larger aircraft, the logistics side of things, it's not necessarily my bag, but I have really enjoyed this aircraft. I really, uh, it just gels. I, I just like, I like being in the cockpit of these big planes. It's a, it's a different kind of flying. It's a different kind of experience. There's something very satisfying about it. And of course it is, you know, a weapon of war as well. And there's tons of videos out there on the C-130J being used in a manner that is consistent with what you would see with some of the fast jets, right? It, 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 even though it's going a lot slower, you're still coming in doing breaks, you're still coming in low level, uh, fast and you know, in comparative terms. So the flying is still, you know, seat of the pants in many respects, even though you've got this very large kind of reminiscent of a passenger aircraft, it's it, it can be flown in a manner which is fun to see and uh, tactical uh, is the other point here. So that lends itself again to some different experiences, some different management. And I think if you have a couple of people you want to fly with, then all sorts of fun can be had in multiplayer. So we'll see how this aircraft evolves. And I'm looking forward to seeing more videos on what it's capable of doing with those of you that fly with others. Uh, can use it in a multiplayer environment. I think that really is an exciting prospect. It's a good stuff.
Right, moving over to the second part of the video, the Marianas Islands, World War II. Now, remember, this is part of the Pacific Theater of Operations update that Eagle Dynamics is working on. So one of the things they've done is make some improvements to the map for that era. So the team have been diligently working, they say here, to improve it, ensuring that it accurately reflects the island chain in the summer of 1944. That's our period. Uh, and setting the runway taxi logic, as I said in the intro, has been reworked. Trees along the takeoff areas and landing paths have been removed. Runway surfaces have also been improved and parking locations adjusted. For the rest of the map, they are manually correcting vector data, rebuilding road networks, and refining the, repla uh, the re uh, placement of residential buildings, farmland, and much more. So they've also addressed several points raised by customers, including impassable brushes, impassable bushes and other quality of life improvements. So definitely some good work going on there. Now, one of the most significant changes in a future update concerns an event that occurred many years after World War II ended in the early morning hours of May 15th, 1981, a major volcanic eruption took place on Pagan Island. Now this lava flow moved southwest from Mount Pagan, partially covering the Pagan airstrip and necessitating the complete evacuation of the island's then 54 residents. Since the vector data for the maps is based on modern information, events like this can be overlooked when creating an historical map. However, some observant customers quickly pointed out this event and its impact on the Pagan airstrip. Armed with this knowledge, ED has conducted an in-depth investigation using imagery from the 1940s and discovered that the Allies had extensively photographed the island. And so they located these high-quality surveillance images of the airfield and its surroundings allowing us to accurately recreate the airfield, they say, as it appeared nearly 40 years before the volcanic event. So a nice little attention to detail, and thanks to those customers with knowledge of the historical events uh, and the existence of information, perhaps, that could help ED make that adjustment and, again, more accurately reflect the period of time those maps uh, were, were created, if you like, and reflect the period that we're looking to fly in. So some cool stuff there. Now lastly here, they plugged the Virtual International Air Festival that is going on this weekend. Uh, there is a Twitch tw uh, channel for it, so I'll put a link in for that. It's, being, it's based in Switzerland, so uh, this won't apply to most customers, but uh, every year this goes on. And featuring up to 200 pilots from 18 countries so, and 61 demonstrations. So it's a kind of a cool way of showcasing what DCS is capable of. Uh, if you haven't seen the interview with WAGS, with the Hooligans, released last weekend, I think it was, uh, do check that out. Lots of really valuable information, including WAGS' love of Dire Straits and Mark Knopfler, his, his, his favorite guitarist, which Mark Knopfler is one of my favorite guitarists too, so I didn't realize I had that, uh, you know, symbiosis there with WAGS. Dave Gilmore, probably my all-time favorite guitarist, but I grew up listening to a lot of Dire Straits. So it's an interesting article about WAGS' background and also things coming to DCS. Uh, I'm looking at getting an interview with WAGS here soon myself, so stay tuned for that coming up. Uh, I've got some questions for him, and uh, yeah, had uh, a few people ask me to ask him things about Vulcan API, stuff like that. So if you have a question that you'd like to uh, maybe uh, throw out there with WAGS, it has to be a reasonable one, obviously. Um, maybe I could include that as part of the interview. We'll see how things go. The end of the year is nigh, and around the verse, not too much else going on. We did get news, as I said uh, last week or the week before, that the LA-7 is being released in 2026. One thing that came out of the interview with WAGS is that the dynamic campaign is not coming this year. Now, I've been speculating about this all year, about whether or not we were going to see some more information. Uh, it looks like at this point, they are not going to be ready to release it this year. Probably not a surprise for most people. Certainly, WAGS was pretty candid about the fact that it's been a much bigger task than what they expected. Uh, a lot of things that they need to overcome before they can release it properly. We talked about air tasking order, uh, the work with AI for ground units, and updated ATC stuff. So a lot of stuff we've already talked about or speculated on and figured that that might be going on and probably some optimization issues as well to make sure that the whole thing you know, flows properly. So again, an interesting discussion point. When that's going to be released, as Wag said, it'll be done when it's done. 
And I think in fairness too, he pointed out this is not like um, other campaigns that we've seen. I think the definition of a dynamic campaign is pretty loose because they vary. And of course, some of these campaigns are pretty old, early 2000s, 1990s. Uh, DCS is a different beast and has a lot more units, a lot more aircraft, a lot more full fidelity aircraft than some of these older games had at the time that they were created. So that in, in, inherently involves more complexity that is, as was kind of indicated, <laughs> a lot more difficult to iron out than what perhaps they expected. Plus, we've had a major evolution in the game as the as time has you know waned on. We've jumped across uh, several versions of the game. We're up to 2.9 right now. Five, six years ago when they started this or earlier, you know, the game was in a much different state. Uh, and one of the examples Wags gave was, you know, third party developers producing aircraft from several years ago that were good by the standard of several years ago. Uh, but now with the laser scanning, uh, the high resolution imagery that we expect from aircraft, uh, these, uh, these aircraft don't pass muster. Uh, for the modern customer. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, evolutionary, if you like, or progressive concepts that also have to be factored in there. And one of the things that's also happening, we see major improvements every three to five years with computer hardware, uh, which then, you know, throws in some potential performance boosts that some cost customers are going to benefit from straight away because they can afford to buy, you know, bigger GPUs or uh, CPUs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, where other customers may still be languishing behind a little bit just because of you know price point on these matters. So, and we're seeing that kind of play out a little bit right now with RAM prices apparently going up uh, exponentially. The cost of GPUs has been pretty expensive. Uh, the accessibility to some of this hardware too has been um, restrictive. So we live in a very dynamic world from both the hardware point of view and then the software as well in the background. And I think that plays into some of the calculus, if you like, of, of how this dynamic campaign is going to be slotted in. He talked a little bit about the new GUI interface for that as well. So lots of variables, and we're going to have to wait and see a little bit longer before we get some more what I would call tangible evidence of how this is going to function. Once we start seeing more revelations, uh, certainly a lot more than what we saw in the snippets of the 2025 and beyond video, which was uh, some of the you know units moving around the battlefield um, recorded you know more for cinematic point you know purposes rather than actual in-game footage footage that we're we're looking for. I mean, we did see bits of it, but not to the degree that I would like to be able to make more of an assessment about with regards to where things are at. So stay tuned on that matter, and it's going to be interesting to see what gets plugged in here towards the end of the year with regards to any future updates as described with the Marianas map. And then I guess we're looking for 2026 and beyond. We still have, remember, the Eurofighter 2000 in the wings, the A6 as well from Heat Blur. And Eagle Dynamics itself is working on several projects ranging from the F-15C through to the F-35, the Hellcat, and we already talked about the Pacific Theater of Operations. So there's still tons and tons of stuff going on there. The dynamic campaign, naturally enough. So there's reasons to hang around. I know a lot of people have expressed some waning interest in DCS, and obviously there is some drama in this community as well with regards to certain third-party developers and conflicts there, which doesn't help matters. But uh, things like the C-130 Hercules really help... Uh, me stay excited about the franchise. I still really enjoy some of the things that are coming out right now. And every new aircraft seems to dictate, if you like, I guess a new threshold for capacity for what the game can offer raises the bar a little bit. And this is really uh, fun to see these third party developers push the envelope a little bit in terms of what DCS is capable of, uh, in terms of the quality of the aircraft being delivered, the features that we see and some of the unique and exciting and innovative features that some third-party teams are delivering. The checklist, for example, with the Z130J is a great example of that. So stay tuned. No point in burning the whole thing down yet, and hopefully we'll have an interview coming up here as well to uh, talk about some of these things. So we'll see you next time on the DCS. Sit Rip, Mr. Prickly Hedgehog out. Thanks for listening.
Right, wrapping up this week's video is a promotion from Pimax, a brand new one, the Be The Maverick DCS Special Edition promotion, which is a limited collaboration between Pimax and DCS. It's created specifically for the flight sim community. So if you purchase any Pimax Crystal Super QLED model, either 50 PPD, 57 PPD, or the Ultra Wide, and you'll receive DCS's most iconic module, the FA18C Hornet. Now it's normally valued at $79.99, you'll get this for free. So step into the cockpit, feel the afterburners roar, and experience the sky the way Maverick would. High G maneuvers, carrier launches and landings, and the raw power of the Hornets. Beautifully rendered interior and exterior in ultra sharp clarity, thanks to Pimax. When you buy the bundle, you get the Pimax Crystal Super, and then also the DCS module. An upfront payment of $799 is required if you decide to split the payments over 12 months. I'll put a link into the description below so that you can join that particular promo. Remember too that well, up to the end of the year, Pimax is also running that trade-in promo. So if you do have an old headset at home that you're not sure what to do with, you want to upgrade it, well, take advantage because the clock is ticking.